Uh, so we actually were not intending to start a company. We're just like, oh, fuck it. We got nothing better to do. I was like, yo, let's just call up some of our buddies. And so we, we called up uh, Kev Kevin and Emmett, right? We called up like Steve Chen from YouTube and, um, you know, like some of the C-suite at EA and, you know, the founders of Respawn, uh, founders of Riot, right? And, you know, a bunch of other <laughs> What's up, everybody? It's Justin Codd. Welcome to Secret Stash. I'm here uh, as the co-founder of Stash with my co-host, the one and only Archie Stonehill. I'm very excited to be here. We have a great no another guest this time, and I'm excited for the conversation. Uh, so today we're joined by our friend Dennis Spong, who is the uh, world's first professional gamer, legendary, and has had such an impact on gaming that I think you even have a league character named after you, right? Fresh. Uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, two story. <laughs> um, and then Dennis also co-founded a bunch of companies uh, in the gaming space, including GX Media, which uh, developed a bunch of gaming news sites, and then Xfire. And today, he's the founder of uh, GGWP, uh, an anti-toxicity platform for games. Or do you guys say good game, well played? Uh, we say GGWP. All right, GGWP. <laughs> so, hey, Dennis. Hey, thank you for having me. It's good to hang out here. All right, Archie, what are we talking about today? So today we're going to talk about the relationship between developers and players, um, both from the kind of player perspective and from the developer perspective, since Dennis has been on both sides and facilitated both. Um, in fact, as Justin mentioned, Dennis was kind of the first VIP player uh, as an esports pioneer, um, but he was also way ahead of the curve in a bunch of other things that have become normal and kind of required in games now, like uh, online content strategies, community management, social networking. Uh, so we're going to dig into how Dennis's career has seen him kind of expand the ways in which players engage with their games, uh, as well as each other, um, outside of kind of the gameplay itself. So, okay, so let's start, let's start at the beginning at the esports, because you basically, you're like the grandfather, you started this whole space. Basically, my career is, is entirely <laughs> due to your career, which is awesome. Um, so let's go back and tell us about, you know, for, for the young kids who don't know, tell us about your start in esports. You, you started with Doom, right? Yeah, I was the world champion of Doom, Doom 2, Quake, Quake 2, Quake 3. Uh, I retired after Quake 3 came out. Um, I mean, yeah, there was no such thing as esports at the time. So it was really purely by chance that it even became a thing for me, at least. Um, it certainly would have become a thing eventually. Um, you know, I was just like any other kid playing games. Uh, didn't realize that I was particularly good at them, but, you know, um, started competing in some uh, local tournaments. So, again, there was nothing really online. It was just kind of local people would just get together at land parties and stuff, right? And and I started winning. You know, if you believe in the 10,000-hour rule, uh, you know, I'm the middle child. Uh, Justin, you know my brother, Lyle. Uh, yeah. I, you know, he's older by three years, and we have a younger brother as well that's three years younger than me. And um, we used to just play each other. You know, we were lucky enough in those days to have uh, multiple PCs at home that were networked. And so we would play against each other. Um, so, you know, we got a lot of practice in before we, we started playing online, really. And um, uh, for a long time, I couldn't beat my older brother. <laughs> he, he was uh, better. <laughs> he was better for a, a hot minute. Um, you know, there was, but I was like, at a, you know, this is before they, you know, mouse and keyboard was like, and was, there was like a thing, right? So this is my, my older brother, Lyle used to use a track ball of all things, <laughs> <laughs> which is pretty ridiculous if you think back on it. And I was just a keyboard player and it wasn't until I switched to mouse and keyboard that I eventually beat him. And then I never lost him after that. Uh, I remember it was like over summer. Um, but, uh. Yeah, I mean, how the professional gaming really thing started was, um, I remember there was a Wall Street, the Wall Street Journal wanted to write an article about this new online gaming thing. And somehow in their research, they f found online that I was known as the best player. And uh, so he, he he calls me up and he's like, hey, look, I'm, I'm Joe Joseph Ferreira from the Wall Street Journal. Heard your you know, I'm writing the story. Is is it cool if I come and like hang out with you for, you know, for a day just to kind of see what this whole thing is about? And, you know, I was, I think I was like maybe 15 or 16. It's like, I had no idea what the Wall Street Journal was, how important <laughs> it was. Uh, so 
so they um you know he you know we set a time it was like i don't know whatever friday morning or saturday morning or something like that and i forgot that he was coming so he shows up at my parents house door and he's like, oh, hey, you know, I'm supposed to follow you around for a day. And I was like, dude, you just woke me up, man. Like, could you come <laughs> back? Cause so he, he, like, comes back, I don't know, half an hour later. And, and he ends up hanging out with me for the day. And he's, like, watching me log in. Like, I'm on IRC, IRC uh, you know. Uh, for those that don't know, IRC is basically what Discord kind of was based off of in terms of, like, a user experience. And, uh, you know, I started playing people online. And uh, he found it super fascinating. Um, this is like the first right... time he's ever seen a video game played online, basically. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This is like, uh, whatever, 1995 or something like that, right? Um, and uh, so he ends up writing the story, uh, but it was primarily focused on actually me. Um, uh, and it ended up being on the front page above the fold with a little, uh, whatever, you know, that little pixelated drawing uh, of me on the front page. And... Uh, the funny thing was because I had no idea who the Wall Street Journal was. I didn't even tell my parents. <laughs> uh, like my dad found out, he, you know, he worked at uh, uh, Hewlett Packard. It's like a very, you know, corporate, you know, big company, 100,000 people. And they have like a weekly employee newsletter. Yeah. And somehow, uh, you know, because in the, in the article, in the interview, I mentioned, oh, yeah, my dad, his name's, you know, David Fung. He works at, the, at Hewlett Packard and, you know, here in Palo Alto. So it showed up in the in the HP newsletter somehow, and that's actually how he found out about it. It was pretty funny, but uh, you know that that moment literally changed my life because literally by the next day I was getting calls from CEOs of companies wanting to sponsor me. Wow! So like uh, there was a pretty popular ISP at the time called Earthlink. You know the CEO emailed me, wanted to sponsor me. You know. Um, 3D effects and you know, which was like the the um, video card at the time. This is pre Nvidia, basically. Uh, wanted to sponsor me, and then CEO of Hasbro e emailed me, so I flew out to go do some stuff with Hasbro. And yeah, I mean, this was literally within within a year, my life had completely changed. You know, and I was basically making uh, six figures. You know, over a hundred, like about hundred, hundred fifty thousand a year. You know, a, a year from that article. Wow. So that that that's how it all happened. Can I ask what your family's reaction to this was? So my parents are pretty traditional, especially my dad. So he was not a fan. Um, you know, I mean, there was no such thing as esports. There was no streaming. There was not no content creations. Um, you know, effectively, I, I mean, there was no, no such thing really as an influencer. Although I guess technically I was one of the first influencers. Um, you know, I had a blog, and you know, people used to follow me. Um, but uh, yeah, my dad was not very supportive. Uh, you know, he would have much preferred that I, you know, graduated college and, um, you know, became a doctor or something. Right. Uh, and even after the first few companies that we, you know, that I started, um, and had successful exits, the first thing that he would say to me, it's like, oh, so you're going back to school now, right? <laughs> uh, so yeah, he was not it's supportive. Typical then, Asian I, parent. I, yeah. In 1997, I won the, I won John Carmack's Ferrari, right. In a quake tournament. I call. I remember it was it was in uh, E three was, was the finals were at E three, which was happened to be in Atlanta that year. Um, so right after I won, of course, I called my parents to let them know. And uh, first thing my dad says is, "Not congratulations or whatever. It's um, so you, how are you going to pay taxes on that thing?" <laughs> <laughs> oh, I love so, it. Yeah, not not supportive. Uh, how did you all. get it back to uh, the Bay Area? Yeah. So yeah, funny story. So uh, first of all, I, I didn't know how to drive stick when I won it, and it was a, it was a stick shift Ferrari. Um, and uh, it, it, um, so John, it was John Carmack's Ferrari, right? The guy that created Doom yep. and Quake and these games. Um, and uh, he came up to me afterwards, and he asked me exactly that. He's like, because you know we'd become friends by then. I, you know, I was a champion of all his games and stuff. And he's like, Hey, Dennis, how you how are you getting this thing back to California? And I was like, dude, I, I was like, I, I don't know. I hadn't really thought that far. And he's like, yo, just, 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 just uh, wait here. So he like disappears for like an hour or something like that. And he came, came back and he was like, I think he handed me, I want to say five or 10 grand in cash. And, and he's like, yo, this, this should cover your, your shipping back to, to California. Nice. <laughs> yeah. It was pretty, pretty awesome of him. What was, uh, what was your, 
what was your relationship with the id software guys like because i mean for those that don't know they're like legends in game development um they invented a ton of stuff that is just ubiquitous was, were you were you close with them uh i became close to them yeah i mean uh you know as i said uh, uh, you know i was a champion of all their games uh and um i remember john carmack um it wasn't called a blog at the time it was called a what was that thing called it was a it was called a dot plan. Uh, it was kind of like the early days of what a Twitter or a blog looked like. And I remember he effectively, quote unquote, tweeted, there are masters and there, and then there's Thresh um, or something like that. Something pretty nice. Um, and I also ended up writing like, um, so I had like one of the most popular gaming websites at the time, which is wh where our company came from. Ga um, you know, we, we started the company called, our website called gamers.com. And, uh, um, so I had a pretty popular blog that a lot of people read. And then I also had a monthly column in PC Gamer. And then I wrote the official Quick 2 strategy guide. Um, so as part of that, I, I flew out to id Software's offices, which were in Dallas. And um, I spent two weeks there before the game shipped, uh, basically playing, you know, learning the game and then writing a, a guide about it. So, you know, I got pretty close to them just through, through that time. So they were like encouraging of your... Uh, involvement with their game, they were like supportive of what you were doing for the game's ecosystem. Yeah, I mean the the the, the funny thing is, um, you know, the in the, the in the Quake finals for the Ferrari, I, the final match, I won thirteen to negative one was the score. Um, and so it was pretty lopsided. Like most of my games were pretty lopsided. Um, and uh, so he he actually won. You know, they well, he slash they wanted to try to balance, make the game a little bit more balanced. Because they they felt like once once a, a, a good player could lock down kind of the the, the map, in effect, it's you know it's just complete domination, right? Um, and you know a lot of these they call them kind of arena or duel type, type style games today. It kind of still have some of that, but he was trying to find a little bit more balance. And so, you know, I was giving him basically multiplayer feedback to help him try to do that but you know in the end it still didn't really work for quick two <laughs> <laughs> because of the rail gun and, and stuff so how did the how did the esports scene for quake emerge like because it, it, it kind of kicked off with this article was there already esports or did the company did it create esports for yeah. promotion of their game yeah so i mean first of all it depends kind of what you call esports e you know if you if you think of those as like donkey kong and stuff then you know obviously i wasn't i wasn't the first but if, if you're thinking esports like you know online multiplayer games um then that certainly counts um the very first esport event was actually in 1995. um it was called uh deathmatch 95 and uh there was a an online gaming service at the time called duango where, because uh, this is the day of modems, right? You you dial in uh, to be able to play online games against one another. So they had servers all over the world, and they found the champions locally at each of the servers. So they were I don't know whatever twenty ish something, including not just in the U.S. but in the U.K. and and um, I think it was France and, and Germany as well. And then they flew the champions to Microsoft's headquarters in Redmond. Uh, uh, to play live on a LAN um, uh, at an event that coincided with the launch of Windows 95. So it was a pretty big deal. If you actually Google it on YouTube, you'll find a Bill Gates inside Doom uh, <laughs> promo video that they filmed for it. It looks pretty ridiculous, but uh, it's pretty funny. Um, and so that was the first time where you found champions all over the world and flew them all and we competed on the LAN. And... Uh, uh, <clears throat> You know that that was the first big tournament or first real tournament that I won. Um, so it really started in '95, if you consider that the first esports event. Um, there were spectators, you know, hundreds, not tens of thousands. <laughs> um, but uh, and uh, yeah, I won like ten grand worth of stuff. So it wasn't cash; it was like a PC and lifetime supply of id games and a bunch of other stuff. Um, um, so yeah, that that was really the start, and I think that. Uh, the uh, Wall Street Journal, the Wall Street Journal article came out maybe a little bit after that, and maybe that's gotcha. how they had heard about about us, cause, uh, about me, because you know, I, you know, it, I got some press from from that winning that as well. Tell us, tell us where your gamer tag Thresh came from. Uh, so I used to, I got into games actually through Muds, 
which are, think of it as like a text-based World of Warcraft. And uh, I used to play as Threshold. Um, uh, most people in the game called me Thresh anyway, because you have to you have to type to talk to people and stuff. Um, uh, and then like uh, when I when I switched over to play Doom, uh, the the uh, this was actually on Duango that service I mentioned. Uh, they had a max character length, so Threshold wouldn't fit actually. So I just shortened it to Thresh. Yeah, um, and then I looked it up later, uh, like kind of at, at the time I, I looked it up and found that it meant to, to strike repeatedly, mm, like threshing, threshing wheat or something. And I was like, ah, oh, shit, that's perfect. <laughs> um, and what about rivalries? Were there any like back in the day, esports rivalries, any opponents that you, it sounded like you were beating people pretty handily, but <laughs> like, was there anyone who could hold their weight? Uh, I mean, there were, so back in those days, it made it really because of, you know, we're on modems and latency and all that kind of stuff. Um, it was difficult to actually play against people, even, you know, I, I, you know, I grew up in California basically. So it was difficult to play against people on the East coast because, you know, your, your, your pings were just too, too bad. Um, um, so like we wouldn't actually meet often until we had these kind of tournaments where they flew people out. So that, that first tournament deathmatch 95 that I mentioned, there was a, the guy, I think he was based on Flo in Florida or something. Uh, I remember his, his, his handle was Murloc and he was a major shit talker, was considered probably one, you know, the best in the East coast. Um, and, uh, so people were expecting us to meet in the, in the finals and, and we ended up meeting in the semifinals actually. Um, and you know, I ended up beating him and, uh, you know, it's funny cause we we're on stage and I, I remember him, he, 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 he got so upset. He like slammed his keyboard and kicked the chair off the stage. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so that that was something that was pretty memorable, especially as a as a live first, you know, the live the first live esports event. Um, and then the guy that ended up I ended up playing for the Ferrari also was kind of he was considered people used to call him Thresh of the East. Thresh um, of the East, I like it. <laughs> so uh, so there's a lot of shit talking back and forth from like the West, especially this is the back in the day of like uh, you know the rap like West Coast versus East Coast. Yeah, yeah, Death Row versus like Bad Boy and stuff, and so. Obviously, being on the West Coast, I mean, my my clan was called Death Row, so we were like all in on on, on that side. So a lot of shit talking. Uh, expected to meet him in the finals, and and we did. Um, and you know, uh, yeah, obviously, I ended up beating him as well. So <laughs> that was entropy, right? That was his yeah, name? His, his handle was entropy. Yeah. yeah. And were there videos of this? Like, was this being like broadcast anywhere? Uh there there's a video of the final match on YouTube. Okay, and at the time, was it being like streamed? Could you watch it on TV? Or was there any way of watching this? But no. Uh, yeah, the only way to watch it would be through. Um, uh, y you could record a replay, basically, of the of, if, of the match, um, which were called demos at the time, and then um, you could just post the demos up for people to watch. Oh, like within the game. Yeah, yeah, you have to use the game to to, to replay it. Yeah, so I guess that esports is that it's kind of evolved a lot since then, right? Where it's like. That it's, I mean, there was a lot of effort you had to go through to be an audience member back then versus like later on with live streaming and YouTube and stuff like that. Yeah, for sure. There was, there was no live streaming or YouTube at the time. Um, so this is pretty, pretty early days. <laughs> <laughs> it sounds a bit like this community kind of emerged organically rather than was kind of necessarily actively cultivated by it. Would you say that that's accurate, that this was a phenomenon that they kind of saw and, and nurtured but didn't really stimulate? I mean, I think competition is inherent in, in a lot of these, um, you know, online games um, and those communities formed kind of on their own. Um, you know, when we used to hang out on IRC, which was kind of our equivalent of Discord back in the day, uh, you know, I would have hundreds, hundreds of people come in every day challenging me on my on my uh, my t my team's um, uh, channel, um, and so yeah, it was kind of like the wild west, you know. Like, um, uh, but I mean, you know, to its credit, they they certainly supported it. Uh, you know, John Carmack giving up, he literally donated one of his Ferraris as a grand <laughs> prize for our tournament. Is clear indication that they believed in it and 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 supported it. Um, but, but, you know, they did, yeah, they, did they, you know, they didn't like invest a million dollars into like a league or anything like that. Um, you know, other companies uh, tried to do that. Um, so there, there, there was one that started in 1998 called the PGL, uh, Professional Gamers League, where they did have like a million dollar sponsor and stuff. So, you know, they were the first ones to really try to professionalize it. What happened to PGL? That 
that was yeah I'm, I'm, i kind of remember them but what what happened with that did they end up that was like a built around quake right or around yeah there was the tgl games. and there's also yeah. the cpl uh those are two kind of going head to head yeah. um it's you know i think what they found is it's ultimately really hard to sustain with just sponsors yeah uh because you're missing where most leagues and stuff make money which is through the broadcast revenue yeah um you know so when you don't have that it's just a tough i mean I mean, esports today, even now, is, is struggles because they're you know, people don't want to, but you know, people don't want to watch it on TVs generally. They would rather just you know watch it on you know on live streaming platforms and stuff. Yeah, they don't have the TV revenue. The fundamental challenge of esports is that like one, the publishers have all the power, and two, for the publishers, it's a marketing exercise, and so they'll only let the ecosystem actors earn enough to keep them engaged. But you'll never have a independent esports industry. <laughs> um, like you have for sports, right? Where the teams sometimes own the leagues. Maybe the one exception to that I thought could have been Overwatch League, which was organized quite differently, a bit more like an American sports league where they auctioned off teams, but I think the game didn't sustain. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that was... There's, I mean, that Overwatch League auction was crazy. They were... Weren't people paying like $10, $10 million for a license or more? Then what happened? Like, are those all DOA now? Yeah, I think the game dies. Uh, I think they should... Yeah, the, the game dies. Yeah. <laughs> That's... <laughs> Which is the huge risk as well, is that you're like vulnerable. I mean, the football will probably never die. I mean, at least no one can kill it, despite FIFA's best efforts. Um, yeah. Uh, I'm curious, like, what you saw develop in esports, like how you saw esports as a kind of industry or ecosystem develop over time. Like, what what was the timeline from esports from 90s to like 2010s, let's say? Yeah. So I retired in 2000. So you know, by that time, I was running a company of uh, the company that my brother and I started. Um, you know, we were about 130 employees um, and I was CEO, my brother was CTO. Um, so, I, you know, we had raised venture capital funding and all this kind of stuff. So I, it was just too hard for me to like disappear for like a week or two to prepare for a tournament while, you know, I had to run a company at the same time. So I, I finally retired in 2000. Um, and um, the person that kind of rose from there and became quite uh, famous is Fatality, uh, who's actually a buddy of mine. Um, and I kind of like mentored him, you know, when he was coming up. But, you know, I think it was pretty tough early on for him and, and the space because, I, you know, I, I basically retired on top. And so, you know, the, some of the people that won that, you know, the kind of the tournaments and stuff, you know, for a couple of years, you know, two, three years afterwards, didn't get the full recognition that they really deserved because, you know, people are like, well, they never beat Thresh and never played Thresh and <laughs> blah, 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 right? Um, um, because at that time, first-person shooters were still kind of the dominant um, eSport, um, except outside of Korea, obviously, which was which is StarCraft. Um, but yeah, to his credit, Fatality kind of, he, you know, he, he was like, you know, he won like five, six, seven world, world champion of a bunch of games. Um, and... Um, you know, he was probably the first one to really, truly dedicate himself completely to esports. Um, even though I was a pro gamer and stuff, like, and I was also running a company and trying to build a company. So, like, I was always juggling two things at once. Whereas for him, he was all in. That's that's all he did. Um, and so, like, uh, he, he took it to another level of dedication that, that um, you know. Um, that, so, he, I think esports also has a lot... Um, you know, you know, when we look at Fatality and his career and what he did for it, I think he, he did a lot for esports as well. And what were yeah. the games that rose up after Quake and Doom in the 2000s between kind of like that and, I guess, League? Uh, I mean, Quake 3 dominated for a long time. Um, you know, I think Unreal Tournament for a hot minute. Um, you know, obviously StarCraft and StarCraft 2 in Korea really blew up. Um, and, you know, then there was kind of a lull, you know, so like... You know, Fatality, because he was all, all in on this, like, there would be new games that came out. There was one called Painkiller, which I actually never even played, um, where, like, they they, get, they put up a car, um, you know, as as the champion of, of, of their um, the first tournament. And, um, you know, Fatality ended up winning. I can't remember. It was like a Ford Focus or something like that. But all, like... <laughs> it wasn't a Ferrari. But it was like a... It was like a deck... It was, like, wrapped with, the, like, Painkiller stuff. Uh, but, uh... <laughs> yeah, but, yeah, not a... I didn't. I didn't mean that in a demeaning way. I was just, but, you know, it, it was still pretty cool. Um, 
but you know, th- I, I think what we learned even through that experience was like, you know, because they they were so esports focused as a game, uh, uh, that you can't you can't make a game popular just because of esports, right? It, it's it's more what we were just talking about. Like esports hel- helps make the game more popular, but you need a popular game in and of itself. Yeah, do you have any more questions on that, Archie? I have one, which is like just the final question on esports, which is like, I wonder if there's also something about like the mechanical nature of FPSs as opposed to the more strategic nature of the games that are popular now, like CSGO even as a kind of very strategic FPS, and then obviously the MOBAs, that like the more purely mechanical skill of the kind of old school FPSs was not as engaging to watch for the long run as like MOBAs are. I'm curious if you have any thoughts about like game type and the kind of interestingness of the esports ecosystem. Uh, you know, honestly, I'm still surprised at how the kind of uh, er, the arena dueler, you know, the Quake style games aren't more popular because it's a game where, unlike MOBAs, you don't really need to understand all of the mechanics of the game to appreciate the skill. Right, because you just see the guy kill the other guy, right, and it's and it's through a first person, right. Um, so in that respect, I, to be honest, I'm I'm a little bit surprised that it's not more popular. I, I think the, these style of games are just too unforgiving. You know, they're they're one on one on one, and um, you know, there's people that have been playing these games since the '90s that are still competing today and are really really good at it. So like a new player coming in, it's hard for them because there's just um, so so many mechanics around. Uh, controlling the map, controlling the weapons, controlling certain areas, timing, you know, like there's all this stuff that doesn't really exist in like most of the games that are really popular today. So I think I think the learning curve is really steep. Um, with that said, I mean, I think, uh, you know, the MOBA style of games, the team-based style of games are more relatable, you know, because, you know, if, if as long as you know the game and have played the game, right? Because there's a much wider variety of players and personalities and you know obviously live streaming and and um you know is, is a thing so there's a lot more accessibility in getting to know your favorite players and or even finding who your favorite players are and favorite teams right you can watch a lot of different people it's not necessarily just purely based on skill they may be really funny or a shit talker or so, something about them that you know and you can see it actually because you can watch them live stream and, and engage with you Right, so the, I, I think the celebrities or the stars are all, all far more accessible today than they ever have been as well. Um, you know, I, I kind of liken it to like, imagine if LeBron James had like a GoPro camera strapped to his head and you could like talk to, see him practice every day and talk to him while he's like taking shots and you could be asking him questions and he's actually answering, right? Like that level of accessibility doesn't exist in really almost any other sport, yeah. um, which I think it's still, it's still really co- compelling content. At the end of the day, um, it's just different. So when you transition from gaming, uh, from you know, being a gaming pro to um, working full time on your startup, uh, what was that like? Did you did you have any? Did anything translate from like the experience uh, in esports to like running? It was GX Media, right? That was the the first company that you you went full time yeah. on. Yeah, GX Media, we had uh, Gamers.com, which is a platform where you anyone can go and create their own community on Gamers.com. So it was more like a games portal. Yep. Um, and then uh, we had Firing Squad, which was more of like a news uh, content website, like I think GameSpot. Um, but, um, you know, honestly, I never really had the luxury of uh, doing just one of the two, right? Because I I'm, I was always doing both. Um, so like, a week before a tournament, I would basically be focused on just practicing. And then after the tournament is over, I'd go back to, to being CEO <laughs> again. Um, so it was a pretty interesting um, split. And, you know, to be honest, you know, I started in my first company, I was 19. So really had no clue what I was doing as, <laughs> as, a, as a founder. Um, and, you know, my brother and I, we just kind of like, made all the mistakes, you know, uh, you, you could possibly make, um, and learn through those mistakes. Um, but, uh, yeah, I mean, we, we, we caught the right wave, which was the original dot com bubble or boom, uh, you know, in the nineties and, and, um, found ourselves running a pretty big company to be honest, being CEO, uh, even today, this is, I'm onto my fifth company as, as founder and CEO. 
uh, it's the hardest job in the world, honestly. You, know, you, you never really ever feel like you have it figured all figured out um, because you don't. Um, so, you know, I, I think when I focus on the company, part of the reason why I decided to focus on the company and decided to retire, I mean, obviously there was kind of exponentially more pressure because um, part of gamers.com and firing squads success was because I was, you know, the best gamer. Right. Um, yeah. So I had, a, I had, I had a lot of credibility. And so I knew like, you know, I felt like if I lost all <laughs> that shit goes coming down or something. Right. Uh, so there, there was a lot of pressure, um, which was fine. I, I, I think I comp compartmentalized that stuff pretty well, but you know, the, the, the CEO job was infinitely harder in my mind. Um, it was the most stressed that I've ever been that during that era of my first company, I remember like, I think I was 19 or 20, you know, running a company of over a hundred people managing people who, you know, uh, um, you know, like I remember m people would come up and like my VP or something would be like, Hey, you know, my, my wife's pregnant, you know, I'm hoping for a raise, you know, like, the, and I'd be like, I have no life experience to draw on. Right. So I'm like, I don't know what the fuck, like what's right and what's not. Um, you know, I didn't really have a mentor, although, you know, I certainly had a board. Um, and so it was just so, so stressful for me. I, I, I actually developed a food allergy. I suddenly developed an allergy to shellfish because of how oh, wow. um, how stressed I was. I developed like carpal tunnel and repetitive stress, um, not because I played a lot of games, but because I was just so stressed and stuff. So yeah, it was it was a really tough time, um, you know, being that young, running a company uh, like that, you know, where uh, you know we were just figuring shit out along the way. Yeah, I, I mean, I think this about Justin as well. Like, I'm like, what were they putting in the water at like Harvard and Yale when you were there? Because you had like you starting companies immediately and like Mark Zuckerberg and just like, I think that period in the early 2000s and I'm a little bit younger. And so I think my kind of generation grew up with people of your age and profile having started these companies extremely young as like their corporate idols to replicate and emulate. And I think it's a real like detriment, I think, to... um I guess like people's experience that that was kind of the model to emulate because I do think it's really tough. Like when I was a VC, I would see extremely young founders and even if they were extraordinarily impressive uh, and incredibly good CEOs, as you say, it's like a, it's a, it's the toughest job, even when you're, you know, 40 years into your career, let alone, uh, you know, if you're a, a young person who hasn't had too much experience. Well, I think, I think, uh, being super naive yeah. is, 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 it's a, you know, I think for being young, that's that's your real advantage, right? Because we get jaded as we get older. This shit that we are like, oh, there's no way that's going to fucking work. And then, of course, it works now yeah. because everything is about right place, right time, getting lucky with a whole bunch of factors. Um, yeah. So, you know, yeah, I think youth in general just has the advantage of being optimistic and being really naive and not jaded and trying shit that seems to have been done before. Um, but just a slight wrinkle changes everything. That's right? what I was going to say is like you have the, the, the you don't know anything and so you just sort of like a kind of assume that it can it can work and i find with a lot of you know having backed tons of different founders at different stages like when people work too much in like the corporate environment like they're like 10 years into like working at a big company they like lose perspective on like that you could just do anything that like all the rules and are just made up by human beings and like everything all the traditional wisdom is just like made up by people you know and, and you i think it's and so th th there's something lost when you like work too long at a big company. I totally agree. Yeah. So what happened with uh, GX Media, and then like tell us how like you tr you know it was Lithium next or Xpire? How did you transition to X company? Yeah. Um, so you know as I mentioned, Gamers.com was a, a, a community portal where you can go and create your own community, right? Um, and it was made for gamers. So we built all this functionality uh, customization for for the gamer audience. Um, and, uh, we used to get pinged every three to six months from what turned out to be like the CIO and CTOs of some pretty big companies, um, who were gamers because, you know, especially those, those days, you know, uh, you had to be kind of tech savvy to even get into games. Um, so like the CEO, CTO of Dell or the CTO of PlayStation would ping us regularly and they would, they would ask us, Hey, can we license this? This is like the most advanced kind of community software that we've seen. You know, can we, can we, can, which, are you willing to license it to us? And for the longest time, we're like, dude, don't bother us, man. We're, we're a gaming, we're trying to build a gaming thing, you know? 
Um, but uh, you know, when when we were exploring kind of acquisition talks for for Gamers dot com, what we found was uh, the the acquirer was mostly interested in the traffic because we were we were the number one traffic gaming site um, on the net. Although probably about half the audience were not gaming related. It'd be like Christians community and whatever, right? It was just like pretty all over the board. Um, and so, uh, you know, my brother and I had this idea. We're like, hey, why, why don't we just fake door test whether we actually could sell this? Um, now, this is in year 2000, so it wasn't even called SaaS at the time, right? So, but we're like, okay. I was like, yeah, let's, let's try to go sell this. So we went back to Dell and PlayStation who had been pinging us for, you know, about, about a year and a half. And we're like, hey, you know, you've been asking about it. Um, we're, we're, we're ready to, to license it. We're going to, we're, we're spinning out the whole platform group. Um, and mind you, we hadn't actually decided to do it yet, <laughs> just, <laughs> yeah. right? It's just a fake door test. We're like, yo, hey, we're spinning out the platform group. Um, and we're going to, you know, we're going to, we're going to sell this thing. And they're like, great. Yeah, we we're ready. We want to buy it. Like how, how much does it cost? Like, it's like a million bucks or, you know, the license it and blah, blah, blah. And we're like, no, actually we're going to charge you based on usage. Um, and so, uh, you know, I, I mean, I have no idea. I can't even remember how, why we came up with the idea, but we're like, yeah, we're not going to sell it. We're just going to, we're just going to sell it to you kind of as a service. Um, and so, yeah, the first two customers we landed were Dell and, uh, PlayStation. So we launched playstation.com. We powered all of their community facing functionality and same with Dell, uh, which at the time was the gold standard in consumer internet marketing. Yeah. Um, and, um, you know, another just pure luck thing we, we decided, you know, um, to put a powered by lithium on every page at the bottom. Um, so anytime you went to Dell or playstation.com and you went to any of those areas that were powered by lithium, you would see it. And so we just got, um, a ton of customers through that. Um, so we actually did end up spinning off lithium from, from, uh, from, uh, GX media. Um, uh, this, this was the benchmark benchmark back company. Um, and, uh, we ended up selling it for, uh, for a bunch of money to, to Vista equity partners, like 10 years later. I saw when you sold it to Vista and like, I was, I worked in private equity for a while and they were by far, I think the most impressive PE fund. So that is like my old corporate <laughs> days. I was like, wow, you guys sold it to Vista. They're an amazing fund. That's awesome exit. Yeah. I mean, we, 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 uh, we, we thought we could, um, take it public to be honest. It was, it was certainly tracking towards being able to take it public. Um, you know, I think. We're, we're a little bit bummed that we never got the opportunity to do that. Um, but, uh, yeah, I mean, it was still, still a great outcome and, and, um, you know, I mean, yeah, the one common thread with actually between all my five startups is around, uh, social and community platforms. I've just been obsessed with it from, from a long, from being a part of the community. Right. Um, so, you know, lithium was basically building communities and social software for, for fortune, you know, 2000 companies. Um, and, uh, we, we not only helped them build the communities, but also help them manage it. It seems like a, a lot of what you did was about like unleashing the creativity and like power of communities. Like esports did that as well. Like basically letting people run wild with these products they engage with and, you know, harnessing that creative energy by communities. Yeah. I mean, I, 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 I don't, I don't know what it is. Maybe it just cause it was the first company that we started or, or something, but you know, I've been obsessed about it for a long time. Um, and you know, at lithium, we, we use data to identify who your brand advocates were within the community. Uh, cause we're powering the communities for like Sephora, AT&T, Google, eBay, PayPal, et cetera, including PlayStation, Nintendo, and a bunch of game companies. Um, and then seeing kind of the toxicity and stuff that might appear out of those. At those times, you could just find a volunteer moderator from your community, and and that was more than sufficient. Um, but obviously, you know, we're well beyond that scale now. Um, but yeah, I would say most of the companies I started were just either around community. I mean, lithium was kind of accidental. Um, you know, XY definitely was something that was more built for me. Um, all my frustrations as a gamer at the time, uh, you know, in terms of being able to communicate and chat and keep tabs on my friends, um, you know, that, that, that one was purely just like, you know, again, I don't think I ever really considered the financial aspect of entrepreneurship as much. It was more just following your interests. Yeah. It's just like, no one's doing this shit. Why not? Let's just, let's just go do it. You know, that, that's kind of how it's always been for me. Um, I love it. 
like with Xfire, you you were really ahead of the curve. I mean, you basically invented Discord before <laughs> Discord, right? Like it, you kind of created this community chat. I mean, I used to use ICQ. I remember for Ultima Online back in the day, like to talk to my clan friends. But um, you kind of like built something that was really on the cutting edge. Like, what are some of the ways that you feel like you innovated there that like have shown up that are like now super prevalent in modern day? Yeah, I mean, so, you know, um, I think it's unfair to Discord to, to say that we invented Discord. Um, but, you know, I think there were certainly stuff, um, you know, that we that we did actually invent um, that is being used today and by a lot of gaming chat clients. Um, you know, the, the XFire idea was born out of, you know, at the time, most people used IMs to, 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 to keep in touch with friends, right? AOL and Messenger, Yahoo and stuff, right? Um, and, uh, so the X fire idea came from, you know, like building an instant messenger that was built for gamers. Um, and a lot of my frustration at the time was number one, like, uh, when you used to get those inst IMs, um, you know, uh, they, they would, uh, blink on your screen and steal the focus away from your game. And so most games are full screen apps. So it would pop you out of the game, right? Which is super annoying. You can imagine. Uh, and that's what all of the instant messengers did. So we, we're like, okay, let's build an instant messenger that doesn't do that, first of all. <laughs> um, and then number two, you know, can we actually detect what game you're playing uh, and then show that as your status to your friends, right? So um, that so we invented, they call, them, they call it game presence now. So we invented this idea of presence where you could actually see what game your friend was playing um, and then you could join them with a click. So we would actually, it was crazy, tech at the time, we would actually sniff your IP, your network traffic to detect what IP address you're connected to, you know, what server you're connected to. Uh, and that's how actually we would surface it and, ma and make it easy for you to join your friend. Um, we also invented in-game messagings, uh, so in-game overlays. Um, so we actually didn't start with in-game overlays. We just had messages that didn't steal the focus from the game. And then obviously it, the next step was like, dude, it would be so awesome if you could actually not have to alt tab out at all. You could just send messages directly from inside the game. And we, we had an amazing uh, engineering team. Um, so they, they basically figured out how to hack OpenGL and DirectX and draw it basically on top of the game. Uh, so in-game overlays we invented. Um, uh, you know, so you know those are three things that certainly I think every game chat client uses today, uh, whether it's Steam or Discord or otherwise. Um, and then we obviously introduce uh, voice chat built directly into Xfire, uh, live streaming built directly into Xfire, uh, gamer profiles we also invented, right? So we tra we tracked all the hours and achievements and then um, had it in a single profile for, for you to be able to look up. Um, so yeah, there were a, a lot of really cool, fun things that we ended up doing, but you know, obviously it came directly from stuff that we wanted as gamers, right? So that <laughs> made it pretty easy. It's just like, whatever you dream up, it's like, you know, we were by far the most used chat client at the time uh, for gaming. Um, you know, I, I, we got up to whatever, 40, 50 million uh, users, right? So um, we got to try a lot of really cool, fun stuff. Wow. That's a lot of users. I, I'm curious. I mean, I have a bunch of thoughts. Like we are trying to build like first party launcher products that kind of do a lot of what it sounds like you were doing, which is like enhance the broader experience of engaging with the game. So I think for example, like social discovery, like meeting other players is something that's pretty unsolved in games today. It's kind of, you know, jury rigged through forums or discord, but I think that's something that you could do more, for example, in a first party client with. Yeah, we did. We did. We did. We did. We had that actually on day one. We had, um, uh, it would recommend uh, other users that um, that you should connect with based on the games that you play. Um, and we also had a friends of friends feature. So you could turn it on, you can toggle it on or off. So if you wanted to, you could actually populate your buddy list with friends of friends uh, and then see what games are playing and stuff. So, to tr you know, now part of it was just more for virality because, you know, we had a cold start problem where, you know, we needed more, you know, a, a chat client's not useful unless other, you know people on it. Um, so we had that on day one to try to help with that, a friends of friends feature. Did people meet friends on it? Yeah, actually a bunch of people. Yeah, because you would see them playing and then you'd be like, oh, hey. And it would tell you that, hey, you know, Justin, a friend of Dennis is playing Final Fantasy and you're, you know, you're, you play Final Fantasy and you could see him playing it in real time, right? And so, you, you know, people would make, a lot of people made friends through that, which is pretty cool. 
That's awesome. Did did you guys look at distributing games, like challenging Steam? Um, because the timing must have been interesting from a kind of PC game sales perspective. Is that something you explored? We we definitely thought about it. Um, we got acquired before we actually had a chance to to um, to do it, so we never we never got to it. But uh, I think there w- there was a huge opportunity at the time to, to maybe do something pretty interesting. But uh, <laughs> yeah, it, we we, ne- we never got to it, unfortunately. Funny story about um, about X Fire is like um, your co-founder Mike Cassidy. Uh, he he showed up at a Justin TV board meeting before he twi- pivoted to Twitch. I think uh, my investor brought him in, uh, like Stuart Alsop. He was like he was like because like, we were super young. We were like I don't know in our mid twenties at the time, and similar to you, like when you started off, like not drawing on a deep well of life experience to make decisions or anything like none of us had ever worked at companies or anything so you know my co-founders were all like my, my age and um so i think Stuart was like oh this guy's needs some like professional help or something like i need to bring in someone to like tell them what to do and he gave me this advice that was like i remember this day it was like uh co-founder is not a job title like just because you're a co-founder of the company you need like an actual because we had four co-founders who were all like kind of just, we were making decisions all together and like we weren't really dividing and conquering because we were such, you know, it was like four people with three big <laughs> egos. And so he kind of gave us that advice and I, I remember it as like, now I'm like, you know, we kind of had to go and, and actually become, take job roles in our own companies and like actually be responsible for some set of thought, things. And it was, it's pretty impactful for us. Yeah. No, Stuart was an investor in X-Fire too. So there was another kind of link between X-Fire and Justin TV. And I was curious about the timing on this, which is X-Fire actually launched a live streaming product, I think, for games at some point in the late 2000s. Is that accurate? Yeah. What was the timing on that versus Justin TV's development for um, kind of gaming Twitch? Uh, to be honest, I don't remember. Um, was yours client in, in your own client or was it streaming out to the web? Xfire was the streaming client. Yeah. And you could watch it both within the client or on, we had a website too. It was just xfire.com that you, you could, but we never tried to build it as a live streaming platform, so to speak. You know, if you think about Xfire, it was really mostly about um, keeping you connected with you and your friends, right? So it was more like, hey, if I'm, if I'm streaming, you can watch me stream as, as someone that's a, a friend of mine on, on Xfire. Um, but again, by that time also, I'm pretty sure, yeah, we were, we, we got acquired in 2000. Six, so you know. To be honest, no one really cared that much anymore. <laughs> uh, uh, and I, I had left, you know, shortly after the acquisition too. So uh, most most of the key people had. So you know, at that point, it was really more just maintenance um, than like trying to do anything big. Thank God. <laughs> <laughs> Thank God. They made him. A, they would have made him probably a good partner because we had such big distribution of. Like we could have democratized live streaming maybe yeah. uh, more for you guys. All right, let's move on to the most recent company. Yeah. So you left, I'm actually curious what happened between Xfire and GGWP. Like when did you start GGWP and what did you do between Xfire and GGWP? Oh yeah, I started another company called Raptor, which was a social network for gamers. Um, so, so taking kind of that gamer profile idea that we had at Xfire and then just multi- multiply it by 10. And what ended up happening with Raptor? Uh, we ended up selling it to Take Two, but it got it got pretty big. We got to about a hundred million users. Oh wow! Uh, uh, th- through through a bunch of partnerships that we had with um, AMD and Intel, and you know a bunch of other folks. Um, but uh, um, yeah, so that that was kind of in between. Um, well, there was Raptor, and then it, uh, we also launched at Raptor a company called Plays TV, which was like the first. Um, uh, it was like. I guess what metal.tv is now, but but before metal, um, you know, because we had such wide distribution of Raptor, um, you know, we thought creating clips and highlights and stuff was a no brainer to, to build into the Raptor client, which we did. Um, so we invented uh, automated highlights. You know how there's a lot of games now. This is before before League of Legends even had a replay system. So where we would record everything, we would record a video, re- actual video, and then we would use, um, uh, we would actually look at the game um, in some cases, sniffing network traffic, in other cases, using the game API and then matching it up so that you knew we could automatically clip out kills, high, you know, deaths and all that kind of stuff, right? And then you could stitch it all together, all the kills together with a click of a button type of stuff. So we, we did that um, and we invented that at, at, at Raptor. Um, 
and plays. But uh, yeah, that's what I did before GGWP. It was in Metal was a maker's portfolio company where I was there. And I spent a lot of time looking at the kind of clip creation and sharing thesis uh, using like AI clip making. I mean, again, this is like a lot of stuff. A lot of this stuff, I think players have kind of just done spontaneously and game developers kind of catch up to where their players are to try and harness this kind of things for organic discovery and stuff like that. Um, that's also awesome. Yeah, it's a, it's a no-brainer. And GGWP, like, so where was the original insight or thinking that led to GGWP? Uh, so with GGWP, I'm one of three co-founders. Uh, my co-founder, Kuhn, founded Crunchyroll. Um, so he, he ran that for 12 years. Um, and then uh, uh, my co-founder, George, um, he had created an AI company called Science, um, uh, which he sold to a public company for a few hundred million bucks. Uh, so the, all three of us were like, uh, you know, successful founders, never worked together, but, um, you know, friends. And, um, you know, it was actually the start of COVID. We were just playing games together, you know, because where everyone was on lockdown. And, um, you know, obviously I'm a, I'm a lot better than they are in, in games. <laughs> so, uh, you know, so I think I, I fucked up the matchmaking when we would go queue up. Uh, so, like, we would get queued with, you know, at a level that was beyond their level. Uh, so our teammates would just get really fucking pissed like dude <laughs> why you know talking to those those two right they're like you fucking suck oh, and, and, and so, you know typical gamer talk um and uh you know we were like dude why is like why 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 sometimes it's funny but most of the time it's not right um and so we're like why does this problem still exist there's got to be a better way uh <clears throat> and i was we we're like oh i don't know let's we're bored we got nothing better to do uh, so we actually we're not intending to start a company we're just like, oh, fuck it. We got nothing better to do. I was like, yo, let's just call up some of our buddies. And so we, we called up you know, Kevin, Kevin and Emmett, right? We called up like Steve Chen from YouTube and, um, you know, like some of the C-suite at EA and, you know, the founders of Respawn, uh, founders of Riot, right? And, you know, whatever, a bunch of our friends in the space and just started talking to them. And um, we're like, hey, look, if you're willing to give us some of your time, maybe we'll come up with some ideas that you've never tried before. Um, and that was, that was basically our promise to them. And, uh, we talked to them, a bunch of people for about four months, came up with the idea of basically what GGWP ended up becoming and gave it back, gave it to them. We're like, no, here's an approach that it, you guys haven't tried. Obviously it leans very heavily on AI and big data. Um, you know, trying to build a proactive system that understands context and looks at things holistically, um, like we we were a multimodal AI, right? So because if in games, you don't just talk through text chat or voice chat, you know, you do both often. And what's more, there's certain ways that you can interact, quote unquote, communicate with other players that can be very toxic in and of itself, whether it's teabagging or, uh -huh. you know, intentionally shooting your teammate or whatever. Right. Um, so we're like, you have to be multimodal. Um, otherwise, like I could be saying fuck you to you in text chat. And then if you're a voice chat solution and you're only looking at voice chat and you say fuck you back, you're get the, you're the one that's going to be penalized, right? Because it's, yeah. it's too myopically looking at just voice chat. Um, so this was our, our thesis. And we're like, yo, you guys, here's, you know, you should have, a, you should create a reputation score, kind of like Black Mirror, like, a, you know, a credit score to, to, to at least synthesize and normalize like uh, someone's behavior historically you know, blah, blah, blah. Um, and so we went back to everybody like, yo, here's, here's what you guys should do. And then they basically all told us it's an awesome idea. We'll never be able to build this internally. Um, and can you guys go please build, please build it. And if you go do it, then we'll, we'll, we'll work with you and we'll, we'll, we'll fund you. Yeah. I remember hearing <laughs> about GWV's approach and we'd looked at a ton of like mo just more pure play, like moderation companies. Uh, and I remember the kind of difference between those and the anti-toxicity approach you guys were taking. One of the things that struck me is like, it required a really good understanding of games and gameplay in order to build GWP's approach, unlike a kind of generalized moderation software, which was like, yeah, text-based, chat-based, et cetera. Yeah. And you know, a lot of, all of the first generation AI content moderation tools were just basically detection models. So they were yeah. selling the models into the companies. Um, and so, uh, um, you know, and a lot of them came from like academic backgrounds. So it was more like a research. Uh, so they were really shitty for games. Uh, and, and, uh, they're all, and, and so what would happen is that, you know, they would just flag all these incidents, right. For the moderators to review. And there's all these false positives, but because they're not an end to end solution, there's no way to re retrain 
right? They're just selling you the models. And that, that's what almost everyone does today, except us. We're, we're like a full end-to-end -end solution. So not only are we multimodal, we also actually take it all the way from detection of an incident to incident response, all the way to user management. So we could actually automate sanctions of users and stuff too. Um, and because we're end-to-end -end and, um, you know, we just have a much more data on uh, every user. Um, you know, so like understanding the history of a user is critically important. So um, what's the benefit? Yeah. What's the benefit to the, that you've seen for the game companies? Like when they create more positive communities, does that show up in their underlying metrics in some way? It does. Yeah. Um, they see 15% higher engagement and almost a 10% improvement to turn. Yeah. Cause people uh, just like don't want to be abused. By them. <laughs> yeah. I mean, how many people do you think we know? friends of yours that have been afraid to try League of Legends or Counter-Strike just because of the reputation of the community. Yeah. Right? Um, a lot. Uh, and how many have quit? Um, you know, we, we, we actually did a study. Uh, George, my co-founder, did a talk at GDC when we, we looked at this data. It showed a m somewhere between a minus 16 to 20% retention of users that have been victims of toxicity. So we actually tracked the user that was a victim of harassment and then tracked their uh, engagement over you know, 30, 60, 90 days, um, it's, it's real. Um, now of course the challenge is like for, especially for a new studio, they're like, dude, we're just trying to fucking build a good game first. Yeah. Um, and so that often takes priority over, um, you know, you know, uh, for the, especially for like the newest teams that don't come from a, uh, live ops background. They're like, oh yeah, we're just trying to focus on building a game. Uh, and then they worry about safety afterwards. Um, but you know, the folks that actually came from Blizzard or Riot or something, they understand how important it is. Um, because the other stat that's pretty compelling is uh, a new user who tries a game for the first time, if they experience toxicity within the first few games, they're like 90% never coming back. I mean, that makes sense. It's pretty intuitive actually when you say it. Um, yeah. Yeah. Are there any game companies out there that you think are doing, or studios that, that are doing a good job of building positive communities? Um, I mean, the one that I would point to, uh, because they're pretty famous for doing so, is a company called That Game Company. Uh, it's Genova Chen's company. He, you know, They made Journey, yeah. which was a very critically acclaimed game, although um, their, their game called Sky is quietly one of the biggest games in the world. Um, you know, it's, um, I can't talk about their numbers, but you know, tens of millions of MAU and, and, um, you know, I think close to double digits in, in DAU. Um, so it's a giant game targeted mostly towards women and children. Um, but what's really cool about their game is like their whole mission is about bringing people together in a positive way. So the game itself is literally designed with that idea in mind. Uh, so they care very deeply about this stuff. They actually are one of they're one of our customers as well. Um, but uh, they will go to the point where because uh, some some of toxicity comes inherently built into the game's design. Like if you think about why MOBAs are so toxic, yeah. like you maybe only play one champion, right? There's one champion that you play, and if your team bans that champion or takes your champion, you're gonna be you know you're kind of fucked. Uh, and that's where the toxicity starts even before the game actually starts, Is right? <laughs> um, you know, but for, for that game company and their game, Sky, anything that they, any type of interaction they see that generates toxicity, they will literally change the game to try to get rid of it. We actually discussed them on our first podcast with Mitch Lasky as like an extraordinary investment of his be because of a lot of what you're describing. Like it's done as well like monetization strategy in a way that's like so non-predatory and you don't feel like you're being taken advantage of i guess and I, this was something we want to ask you which is like how do you build this into game design especially competitive games right where there seems to be a kind of you know dependency like in league i am terrible at league and so my friends would joke that like playing league with me is like playing a new game mode where about like 20 minutes in a stacked mid will emerge and like you know, level 16 when everyone else is level 12 because I'm so bad. And if you play with <laughs> me, like, you know, I'm just going to die a bunch to the enemy champion and that ruins the game for everyone else. Um, and so how do you think about, like, redesigning games to be less toxic in their game design as well versus using a kind of anti-toxicity tool like GWPs? 
I mean, it's not really our place per se, although we, we do provide advice. Um, it's more about, for us, it's more about sharing best practices and where we're seeing hotspots in their particular game or community. Um, you know, and then giving some recommendations here and there, but you know, look, ultimately we're not game developers. These guys know better than us. Um, you know, and look, and, you know, I think people often mistake toxicity for trash talk. Like they're actually not the same thing. Most of toxicity mm-hmm. actually comes from your own team. You know, we're not, we're not trying to get rid of trash talk. Right. And you know, some level of toxicity is, you know, some games are really built and designed around, you know, rust as an example, like the toxicity is built into, and they, they like it. Um, but you know, there's a point where toxicity also, you know, or trash talk and stuff crosses the line. Um, you know, so, yeah, I mean, for us, it's, um, a big part of what we do, you know, people think of content moderation as being kind of what safety is about online, but moderation is only half the battle because moderation is like trying to protect your user base in community. The other half, at least from our perspective is really how do you nurture and shape the community to be more positive? Um, and so, you know, and that's how we lo- largely use AI and, and, and data is to try to nudge people, um, and help kind of basically use every incident as a teachable moment. So you try to, it's not just sanctioning the players. It's also messaging and kind of communication with them and being like, Hey, you know, that's not nice. <laughs> like, yeah. And for good and bad. So yeah. we, we, we build models to detect positive behaviors too, oh, and to, cool. to, again, to, to pop up and say, Hey, great job. Keep doing what you're doing type of stuff. Right. So it's uh yeah, most of the stuff we do is really just, um, uh, letting the user know that, Hey, we see it. You're accountable. Yeah. It's bad or it's good and stop doing it or it's going to result in something. Right. Um, and it actually is incredibly efficient. Yeah. I mean, it, it's a kind of instant feedback mechanism inside the game. Right. Like that's amazing. You could even give as a game, you could like give someone stuff for be doing good behaviors or whatever. It's, it's what we're, what we're, we're trying to, we've been talking to developers about doing exactly that. Yeah. Right. I love that. Um, it's kind of what Sky does a little bit. I mean, Sky is very good, I think, at rewarding positive behaviors and positive... I'm curious, like, do you guys get involved with, like, matchmaking and game modes? Because even when you have a game where, like, there's such competitive dependencies that you would create toxicity, I found, like, when I'm playing with four of my friends on my team, it's a much less toxic environment than if I'm playing with someone who's trying to, like, rank up, right? Um, yeah. Yeah. I mean, yeah, d- d- you shouldn't think of GGWP as a content moderation platform. We are an anti-toxicity platform. So like the reputation score that we generate, we actually give back for free to our, our, our partners. Um, and so some of them, you, uh, some of them actually make this the reputation score public, like the Uber rider rating. Yeah. Um, but it's up to them. Uh, and some of them, um, are starting to use it for matchmaking. So, you know, in the same way that, you know, most matchmaking is based on skill. So your ELO or your rank, right? Like a silver player won't get matched with anyone that's, you know, outside of gold, silver, bronze. Um, so you can think of the same thing for reputation. So if you're like a B reputation player, maybe you will, on your team, you'll only get matched with A, B, and C. You put all these, all the same people in their circle of hell. Yeah. But, there's like a justice to that. <laughs> yeah. The toxic <laughs> groups. Well, the funny thing is like the toxic people, want to be the ones that are toxic. They don't want to be on the receiving end of being toxic either. Yeah. So, you know, it's, it's about trying to, you know, do you build an intrinsic or extrinsic, you know, motivations to try to be, become better. Uh, and, yeah. you know, and then we also have like, you know, again, sanctioning is the last resort for us, but even that has, you know, there's automation, but it's, there's a kind of a ladder, mm-hmm. right? So like the first few times that you do something, maybe you're just getting muted for the match or you're just getting a warning. And then after you've exceeded that threshold, that now the next time you're getting muted for the day. Uh, and then you get automatically unmuted, right? And then next time after that, if you keep doing it, maybe you're muted for three days and then a week. And then, you know, so like there's a progression there where, and again, the idea is a user can't say, dude, you banned me out of nowhere. What did I, I don't even remember what I did, which is very common, right? In these yeah. games, because you would have, have received hundreds, <laughs> maybe thousands of messages along the way <laughs> and mornings along the way before you actually got to the point where your account was actually banned. Interesting. So, yeah. so you've, um, like this is a really interesting piece of software because it's something that was a blind spot for basically every developer for a long time, right? Like they kind of weren't doing anything. They're like, we can't solve this problem. And it turns out there's a huge amount of lift in terms of retention and activation of players. It sounds like when they fix the problem for their, their players, like, are there any other blind spots out there that you think that developers are like, are not 
paying attention to when it comes to understanding their player base and their communities? That might be a hard one. Maybe there's a billion dollar company at the end of that answer. <laughs> Distribution. <laughs> 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 I mean, I, I, yeah, I say it jokingly, but it, you know, it's, I, I think it's it's also real. You know that I think a lot of companies struggle to develop direct relationships with their players. Um, you know, I think a manifestation of that is obviously now every pu big publisher, at least, has their own platform, which some can argue is both good and bad. You know, who, who wants to have eight clients sitting on their PC uh, from you know one from every publisher? But you know, it, it's part of the reality is that you know. If, uh, um, it's it's hard to truly understand your players, um, you know, without having a direct relationship with them. If if everything was just through a store that you don't control, you're pretty limited in in what you can do and how you can continue building that relationship with your players, right? Because we we see, we're seeing more and more of these forever games, right? These live ops games that literally last forever. Um, you know, if if you aspire to be one of them, you know, the sooner you actually build a relationship with them. Uh, you know, you know, the, the better, uh, the more, the better you understand them. Right. Yeah. I think that a lot of those platforms have like not really justified their own exper existence and they use the kind of brute force of making their platforms content exclusive, right. To be like, you can only access our game through our platform, <laughs> whereas they really should be thinking, how do I make this such a better distribution experience for players that they want to adopt my first party launcher rather than go through steam. And I think the most kind of you know, black and white, dumb way of doing that is to say you can only access it through us, but you look like Riot's client. It's like a phenomenal experience and supplements the game, introduces you to the store, has your social graph. Like, it's a much better experience than downloading a game through Steam. Yeah, I mean, uh, for sure. Uh, I mean, they're, they're probably on a cl in a class of their own in terms of the quality of their client. Um, and part of it is just because it helps you. It's not just when you're looking to buy something, right? You know, it helps you just stay connected to the overall universe. You know, whether that's, um, I mean, obviously, Riot has amazing content, you know, um, outside of just the games themselves. Um, so it's it's cool to be able to stay connected to that in, in a meaningful way. Um, yeah, I mean, if they were just sold through Steam, it would, they would never be able to accomplish, you know, half of what they seem to be able to accomplish now. Um, all right, the final question we have is, we call this podcast Secret Stash, and then we try to end each episode with, a secret or a novel story or, you know, something from the, maybe something from the early days of esports that people don't know. Or you can tell us about the type you party with Avicii. That's what Robin really wants. <laughs> uh, okay. I'll tell you the Avicii story. Uh, may he rest in peace. Um, so this was like the early days of EDM. So I think it was like around 2000, what was this? Like 2000, 2009 or something. Yeah. 2009. That's when kind of came out. Yeah. Yeah, 2008, 2009. I, I got really into EDM and 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 and, and stuff. And um, two really good buddies of mine founded this. Um, uh, it, uh, I don't know how popular it is today, but they founded a, uh, this uh, website called Beatport, which yeah, is what still at still the time. still popular for DJs. Okay, yeah, it's like, it's like the every every DJ used to get all their music from from Beatport. So they, you know, my buddies are the two founders. And so when we when I started getting into EDM, I started hanging out with them. And, um, uh, and you know, if, if, uh, we're probably quite alike. Like if you're into something, you know, you don't half-ass it. You just <laughs> go all in, right? Yeah. So like I was just, I dove headfirst into all of this stuff. I was downloading this stuff, downloading unreleased tracks and all this kind of, just to listen to them, right? And um, I came across um, this track from uh, this kid, Avicii, on, online. Uh, he was totally un unknown. Um, but I, I was, it was so good that I like, I remember... And I was hanging out with my friends afterwards. We're like, you know, at an after party or something. I was playing the song for them. And um, anyway, fast forward. Which like song a, was I, it? Uh, I think it was, what was his first? Be uh, the One? Or he had Street no. Dancer, then there's Be the One, then there's like a Rapture mm, remake. No, I mean, uh, yeah. Um, or Levels? It, it was unreleased at the time. I think it might have been, which one was one that was called Penguin at the time? Oh yeah, I know what you're talking uh, about. I can't remember. But this, so the song was called Penguin because it, it um, fade to darkness. Had, fade yeah, into fade darkness. darkness. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So it was basically it was called Penguin uh, because it came from this. Uh, the, the he sampled it from the Penguin Orchestra or something, some, uh, something like that. Um, so it was like a un, it was an unknown track. Anyway, um, so through my friends from Beatport, I got to hang out with a lot of. Um, so we would go 
clubs in Vegas and stuff, and I'd meet the owners, and I became good friends with like people, right? And so there was one New Year's Eve. I was at the you know win for um, uh, New Year's Eve with my uh, my homies, and it was like with the, the the owner of Excess, and like basically it was a who's who of dance music at the time. It was like Cascade and his wife and his manager. Uh, you know, like uh, Afrojack and his manager. It was like maybe only like 15 people and somehow uh, I was at that dinner. Um, and so I was chatting with, at my table, it was like Cascade and his manager and stuff and his wife. Uh, and then this uh, older guy, and I started talking to him and he was the manager of Avicii. Yeah. Uh, but uh, it, no, th- th- this is the guy that uh, booked, he was the t- okay. he did all the booking. His name yeah. is David, uh, David Brady. Um, he ran like the booking agent. Um, so anyway, I was talking to him and he's like, he's like, oh yeah, I'm here with this kid Avicii, but you would have never heard of him. Um, he's like, he's playing his first show in the U S and I was like, I know Avicii. He's like, there's no fucking way you know Avicii. He's like, <laughs> he's like totally unknown. He's opening for, T- he, he's opening for Tiesto. I'm like, no, I know Avicii. Like I, you know, so I like rattle. He's like, holy shit. You actually really know him. So, um, we, he's like, yo, good. This, this, you know, we were going to go. Um, this, so Tiesto was playing at the Hard Rock um, uh, Club. I think it was called Vanity. And then afterwards, Civici, I think he either opened or closed for him. And then we hung out afterwards and I met him. And uh, it turns out he's like a huge geek. He's like a huge gamer, like a huge gamer geek. Uh, and uh, so we just hit it off. And um, uh, it was E3, E3 was coming up a few a few months later, and we were hosting a party. And I was like, "Yo, let's, let's hire Beach to come <laughs> DJ this party at E3 in LA." Um, and so I called up Avicii and and you know obviously met, met Ash as well. And, and uh, we're like, "Yo, hey, we're, we've you know like it's it's a who's who of P, uh, it was like called a PC gaming party. So it was like a who's who of all the PC gaming like the most famous PC gaming developers are going to be there." I know you love gaming. You should come and, you know, we'll hire you for the, uh, to DJ the party. And he said, yes. So we, we, I think we paid him like 10 grand or something. And he played at it. I, 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 no one knew who he was. So he actually played at this party. He had the greatest time because we, I introduced him to like all of the who's who, like of all of his favorite, he was like totally fanboying out. Um, and then he played for two hours at this E3 party. Um, you know, and then uh, the crazy shit was like levels and other stuff came out shortly after that. Yeah. And within a year, within a year, he was being paid, I think it was $200,000 for a set. Um, you know, like he just blew up. Um, but because we met and we, and we hung out and we, he actually, another funny story, he was, someone was squatting on Avicii, at Avicii on Instagram. So he texted me and he's like, yo, hey, dude, I'm trying to get Avicii. Can you help me? And I was like, I don't know, maybe. So, I, you know, I, I, I texted uh, Kevin Sisram, who was like Where? trying to get in, the, you know, he was at the CEO of Instagram at the time, right? And he was, I think he was like getting into DJing and stuff. And so yeah. I was like, yo, hey, I heard you into DJing. My, my, my friend Avicii wants at Avicii and he's been trying to get it. He can't get it. Can you help? He's like, yes, please introduce us. <laughs> so, I, uh, <laughs> so I introduced them and they, he helped them get out of Ichi on, on Instagram. That was amazing. Um, and so, yeah, we used, to, we used to hang out with him all the time and, and, and Ash as well. Like anytime he played a show we'd be in LA or Vegas, I, I basically went on tour with him, which was the most incredible thing. Like yeah. when he played at Red Rocks in, in, um, in uh, Denver, um, I was like, like, I have so many videos. I'm literally standing in the booth with him. Oh, wow. Um, yeah, yeah. And yeah, we came pretty good friends we hang out outside of this stuff but um yeah that's uh, that's my talent. avicii story <laughs> thanks for sharing that dude all these oh, djs yeah, are I mean, nerds man they're like bed, they're producing in their bedroom you know yeah that's literally he was like you i mean i uh, you know he's like yeah i was i went from being in my bedroom to like playing in front of these crazy shows and you know it, it i'd always stress them out a lot but i mean like uh zed is super into uh like uh he was really into overwatch and hearthstone uh, Dead Mouse is a huge gamer as well. Uh, so you know these are, but we 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 would hang out with them occasionally. Just you know we'd hang out with the the gamer DJ crew, the one, the ones that are into games. <laughs> awesome, <laughs> Dennis. Thanks for joining us. That was amazing. Sure. Yeah. Awesome. Okay. Thank you for having me.